So as Gina was saying, I'm Pam Smith. I'm the marketing manager here at Odorings and I actually started working for Odorings at a tender age of 10 years old and started as a school kid, pricking out the old school way by hand um, for all the bedding plants and perennials and, and um, vegetables. And then when I was 19, I got the opportunity to move up to Hamilton and managed a store there for eight years before moving back home to Christchurch and um, moved into the marketing field with Odorings. So I've been here for a very long time. My first experience with growing potatoes was actually for a work competition. And for this work competition, everyone got given one seed spud and we were told to go home, grow them any way we could in a, in a sack and a bag that we were given. And at the end of the three months, we all had to come back and tip them out. The results were quite varying. Some people didn't even have the seed left. Um, so they just had a bag full of salt and um, some of us had a few spuds in there. So for me, that's really what started building my passion on growing spuds based on a competition. Um, so seed spuds can take up a bit of a space in the garden and as section sizes get smaller and smaller, people are demanding more growing into pots as well. So we're going to take you through how to grow in the garden and also how to grow in pots. And then the basic problems around potatoes that they get that are easily solved by having good soil health. Um, most gardeners prefer to grow potatoes between July and September. Um, that's because they're a really frost tender crop. So in Christchurch, you need to get your crops in at the right time to make sure that the crop doesn't get frosted. Now frost will kill off a potato crop. It's like a tomato and stuff. It's really quite sensitive. So later in the talk, I'll also talk about if we get a late frost and it's got your crop, how you can try and alleviate it killing off the crop. So because it is a frost tender crop, People usually in Christchurch grow one crop now in September and then they may put another shorter growing crop in in January to harvest before winter as well. So here you can get two crops throughout the year. Um, Odoring sell certified seed potatoes. Now certified seed potato is a potato that's been grown free of virus um, that you're not going to get any issues of. Off. One of the things I get regularly asked is, can we grow a potato from the supermarket? The simple answer is yes, you can but you're going to get problems with it. You need to go for a certified seed potato that is virus free, otherwise you're wasting the three months that it's taking you to grow a really good crop because you will get viruses coming through it. Um, potatoes are actually a really good crop for someone who's never had a garden before. They are one of the best things to plant to break up clay soil. So if you live on the hill or you have really poor soil in a veggie patch, or you've got a piece of grass that you're converting to a veggie patch, Potatoes should be grown as one of the first things you ever grow because it's going to help break up that soil and they do actually prefer a soil which is slightly more heavy. If the soil's too light they have a few issues, so I don't know what that noise is. Um, they do prefer a soil that is slightly heavy, so a new crop in a new area, it's a really good thing to start with as well. Um, common question I get asked is, do we need to chit our spuds? So chitting is where you sprout the spuds before you sow them. So usually when you get a seed spud, they come in bags, and you'll get a seed spud that just looks like that. It has no little tips off it at all. So by chitting it, you put it on a sunny windowsill or somewhere that's sunny. It's not like when we store potatoes, when we want them in a dark place because we don't want them to sprout and ruin. We want them somewhere where they're going to put on a little sprout. So the sprouts are usually like a limey green to a purple colour. That's the colour that we're looking for when we're, when we're chitting a seed spud because if it goes too white, it's got not enough light. So we want it purple, slightly green colour on the top for chitting. So do you have to chit your seed spuds? No. Should you? Yes. The reason why is you chit, you chit them for about two to three weeks and they've got that sprout started. This gives them a good start once you get them into the garden, so they're going to start growing a lot quicker. If you don't chit them and put them in the garden, they will still definitely grow but it's gonna take a lot longer for that growth to start than what it would if you let them sprout a little bit first. So by chilling them, giving them two to three weeks start, you're probably saving about two to three weeks extra in the garden if you didn't chit them. Um, right, so while you're waiting for your seed spuds to chit, now's the ideal time to prepare your soil. Now with growing anything you're gonna eat or anything in the garden, the key is the soil. Now, the one thing I always say to invest on, whether it's in the garden, in the pots, anything, is the soil. If you've got bad soil, you're going to have a bad crop. You're going to have plants that don't flower. You're going to have plants that don't produce big heads of broccoli or whatever. 
the investment should always be in the soil. If you have healthy soil, you have healthy plants. Healthy soil means less insects and diseases, means less viruses, all these things that can affect plants. You have good soil, you've got good bones of a really good crop in a good garden. Um, so for preparing soil in the garden for pots, uh, for, for potatoes, you're going to dig a trench about 20 centimetres, so about so deep. So by digging a trench, you don't need to like dig this big, long, wide thing. It only needs to be the width of a spud. So you're just going to go through and you're going to dig a little trench, you're going to go down about that far, and then you're going to put some potato fertiliser on it. Now, potato fertiliser is excellent because it's going to promote root growth. Potatoes are a root crop, yams, if you grow yams or, um, I don't know, um, parsnips, carrots, anything like that, you want something that's going to promote root growth, not leaf growth, which is what we want to do for potatoes. So we've dug the trench 20 centimetres, we sprinkle about a handful per metre long trench with the potato fertiliser, and then you're going to cover it with five centimetres of soil. This centimetre, five centimetres, is just going to come from your trench that you've dug. Then, after placing that soil on top, you place your seed spuds. There's no up or down. If the, tip, if the sprouts look like they're naturally facing up in a certain direction, then sure, place them that way. But you can place them that way, it doesn't really matter. They don't have a up or down, they will grow to the light. Um, so you place your potatoes, and you want to place them about 30 to 40 centimetres apart. So just over a foot. So you're going just under a foot deep, just over a foot apart per, per seed spuds. And then you're going to cover the trench back over with the soil that you've used to remove out of there. So you just pile it back in, and then you just leave it. Sound pretty simple? It really is, the spuds. That potato fertiliser is going to give them all the growth they need to last them for that whole season. You do it right the first time, you're not going to need to worry about doing it again. So potato fertiliser, really important. Now there's two methods for growing seed spuds. The traditional method is to mound up around the growth as they grow. Um, the other method is to mound straight away when you've planted them. I've tried both ways. Um, my great aunt Susan, who had an amazing veggie garden, what she always did it the traditional way and she was always out there trying to do new things and she said to me, stop wasting your time, just mound it at the start. So I'll talk you through the differences and why each one has their pros and cons. So in the garden, we mound potatoes, whether it's at the start or at the end, because we want to protect the new tubers that are growing. If the tubers that are growing are out to the light, they get sun scorched, they get open to diseases and pests getting into the potato, which we don't want to happen. So generally what happens, if you're doing it traditionally, is a plant will get 15 centimetres tall, and then you pile the soil two thirds up around the base. Now you don't need to get new soil every time, what you're doing is you're digging trenches between the rows of potatoes and you're bringing it up. And as you keep going along, as they keep growing, you keep bringing it up. So they grow 15 centimetres, you pile the soil up 10. Grow 15 centimetres, pile the soil up 10. Grow 15 centimetres, pile the soil up 10. Generally you'll only do it two times, sometimes three, depending on how good your crop is or how leafy the crop is, but that's, that's how simple it is. If you want to mound it at the start, you need to allow for about an extra two to three weeks before harvesting because they're searching for the light. So they're still doing the work under the soil, but they're still searching for the light. So it's going to take you a lot longer to see that top growth coming through. So when you plant, if you mounted the soil up about 30 centimetres right at the start, you won't need to do anything extra with that crop until it's harvest time. Now, in pots, it's the same sort of theory. So in pots, you can do it both ways as well. Pots are going to need about 10 centimetres of soil at the bottom. Then your fertiliser, another 5 centimetres of soil. And same thing again, you can wait for the plants to grow up 15 centimetres, put 10 centimetres of soil, 15. Or you can just fill the container right up to the top and then you just wait for them to flower or until the maturity date is ready. So uh, it sounds really simple, but it is. And our family saying is, keep it simple, stupid, with potatoes. Keep it simple. It really is that easy to grow in pots or the garden. Right soil, fertiliser. Now, if you're planting into pots, the best thing to plant into is a compost. You can mix it with some garden soil if you want to as well, because they do like a soil that is a little bit heavier. 
But compost, all your fruit and veggie mix is a really good one as well, but compost will do all the job you're gonna need it to do. Um, when planting in pots, per 10 litres of soil, one seed spud. So generally you'd want something that's about 40, 45 litres. So this guy here is a 40 litre, 45 litre bag. So he's only gonna have four spuds in him, four seed spuds to start him off. So you know like the old um, green compost bins from the council, four to five spuds would do that appropriately. Fill it up to the top, you're done after doing your soil and your fertiliser. Um, only thing with planting in pots is they've got nowhere else to source for nutrients. So if you don't do your fertiliser right in the first instance, you may need to top up with a liquid-based fertiliser just to keep it, keep it growing and keep it healthy. You can generally tell if plants are healthy because the colour of the leaves will change from a vibrant green to a yellow. Yellow, it's a bit hungry, give it a bit more feed. Um, in the garden, if you go to give it a bit more feed with potato fertiliser, don't touch the tubers or the plants with it. That's why we're putting that level of soil over the top because it can burn directly on sensitive new growth. So just keep it around the soil, give it a good water in and you're done. Um, same thing applies if you wanted to plant straight into a bag of compost. So this bag of compost is a 40 litre bag. You could plant straight into there. You're obviously going to need to tip some of the soil out, put your fertiliser in, your layer of speed spuds and then just fill it up the top. Make sure any containers you grow into, you'd obviously cut the top right off that and fold it over. But they need to have good drainage, good light. If you have any edible crop, they need at least six hours of, sun, of daylight on the crop to produce well. So light is really important. Um, neem granules is one of my other major tips. So neem granules is actually an uh, organic product or natural product. It's derived from a neem tree. So I don't, have you guys heard of potato for salad? Mm. Yeah, okay. It's a pretty devastating crop. Once you get this insect, you're done. You, you may as well get rid of your crop. It, it injects a toxin into the plant and then the toxin just starts slowly eating away, it'll eat away at your crop um, and then the crop's pretty much had it. So neem granules I apply every six weeks, including at plant, planting time. So you just sprinkle it on. After six weeks, give it another sprinkle on top of the soil, give it a bit of a water in. Um, this is a natural product that keeps insects from infesting your crop. Um, I use it on, I've got a self-sustainable garden with obviously potatoes and vegetables and we've got about, we've got a normal size section and we've got 42 fruit trees. I've sprayed once in seven years. Simply because of that. Um, it's just a really, really good product for high health, keeps insects off. So for me, I use this as a preventative in anything I do in my gardening. Um, so that's the neem granules. Sorry, I start talking and then I go off track of what my notes say and I write notes so I don't go off track but it doesn't seem to work that way. I like to waffle quite a bit. Um, so I know we talked about in the garden how we're going to plant the spuds 30 centimetres apart. In the pots or in containers, you're not going to have that luxury. Just try to bring them in the edge and just space them evenly within the pots. Okay, so 10 litres of soil, one, one seed spud. So if you had a 10 litre bucket, you could only do one in there, just drill some holes in the bottom. Um, not all seed spuds flower. So the other thing is we have people come in and say to us, my, my spuds haven't flowered yet, how do I know when to harvest? You need to keep track of the date. So everything you buy will have how long it's going to take to mature. Um, so you need to keep track of the date if it's not going to flower. And most of them, probably about 80% of the varieties do flower, but there are some odd bulls in there that won't. If you're unsure, put a reminder on your phone or just dig up one plant or have a little barracoot underneath to see how big the ones are on the bottom are because they're the ones that have been left into the soil for the longest and you'll be able to see if you're getting a decent quantity within each plant. The other question I get asked a lot is how many seed spuds will I get off a spud? So the easiest way to remember is for every one kilo of spud you plant, if you are weeding right and you've got the right soil, you should get around 20 kilos yield per one kilo growing. So for me, I'm a bit nuts on spuds. I grow about nine kilos a year and we just give them away to everyone for Christmas because I don't want to store them. But yeah, so for every kilo, you'll get about 20 kilos return. The other thing that spuds need is a weed-free environment to grow. Um, because you're mounding generally as you go, you don't really have that many issues with weeds, except for maybe in the trenches where they start to grow and they can try to overtake. Um, 
Julian's rule of thumb, which has always been a really good one, and he taught me this very young, is to make your rows the width apart of a gardening hoe. Because all you're going to do then is you're just going to go through and you're going to hoe with the garden hoe between your rows. And this is not just for potatoes, it's anything, veggies or anything you're going to eat. And then you're just picking up your weeds at the end and it makes life so much easier. Generally people will just go in and plant and, and plant close together. If you do that hoe trick, you, it makes life so much easier. So there's a really simple trick to follow as well. Um, so for me, we've talked about how you plant them and do it a traditional way with mounding or how you just mound at the start. For me, I just mound at the start. I've got a four and a six year old and time is very precious. Yes, thank you Lillian, my daughter's in the back there. <laughs> um, so I mound at the start and I just give it a few extra weeks before I harvest. I, it's just so much easier for me and you probably lose about 10% of your crop to doing it the normal way, just because it doesn't have that light to reach up to. So every time the light reaches up, the plant grows and it sets out these little roots when, you've, when you pile that soil up and those roots are gonna be putting out new seed spuds. So you can imagine it's strong and healthy, you pile more soil out, they're like, oh, I need to put more spuds out. If the soil's already there and they're reaching out, it's just a bit slower to happen. So that's why if you're harvesting after the same time, you'd lose about 10% or give it an extra two to three weeks before you harvest them. The other way you can tell when spuds are ready to harvest is the tops naturally flop over and they start to wither. They just naturally start to die off, they've had enough, they've lived their life, they've taken up all the energy they've got and so they will naturally start to just start to wilt and you will notice that yellowing colour come in because there's no energy left in the plant. So between flowering, having a quick check and the plant wilting and looking like it's starting to fade, you'll know when your harvest time is. Um, so potato space savers, what they've actually brought out last year as well, which Jenna might want to pass around, is they brought out these potato pots. Um, I actually saw them on Pinterest about two years ago, and so then we talked to our pot company and said, hey, could you bring these in, because they're really cool. Really cool for kids, um, kindergartens and stuff. You only need about one, you could put two in here, per are these potato pots. But the reason these are good is because they allow you to constantly harvest your potatoes at home. So what you do with these guys is it's got a two-part system. So you put your soil in, you have it started off like this. You put your soil in the bottom, bit of fertiliser, bit more soil, put your two seed spuds, fill the pot up to the top. Now with these guys, you only wait about eight weeks. And eight weeks, the roots have set out around the whole pot and then the soil doesn't fall out. So you can start lifting these off to the side and you start harvesting the potatoes out of it. So if you've got a really small family or you don't eat many spuds, this has been a really great tool and for kids to have a little play with and learn about gardening as well. Um, one of the ladies from the Canterbury Horticultural Society, she tried it and she said she was harvesting for a full three months off it, just getting potatoes here and there and just going through and digging them out. So really cool, neat wee thing. Um, Jen will show you because you can see the pot, the potatoes on the side there. Um, so yeah, so those ones are harvestable within eight weeks. The other thing that you can do is, um, where was I going with that one? Eight weeks. Oh, so normal potatoes, depending on what variety, you've got early crops, you've got main crops, and you've got late crops. So an early crop basically just means it's really fast to harvest. You're gonna get a crop within 60 to 70 days normally. Um, the only problem with early crops are they're smaller crops. There's no way you're gonna get 20 kilos off one kilo planted because they're just really short, sharp burst. They don't have heaps of potatoes, but they've got really nice quality, generally a smaller size potato. A main crop potato is gonna take a little bit longer. It's going to take a good 90 to 120 days, depending on the variety that you choose. Um, and basically, the longer in the soil, the more chance they have to put out more potatoes. If you are a storer of potatoes and you want to store them for winter eating and, and keep going through, you need to go for the late crops. Um, the main crops are okay as well, but the late crops are the best ones for keeping. Um, my granddad on my father's side, he used to have crates and crates just full of potatoes to feed his family throughout the year. So when storing potatoes, you need to dry them properly. You don't want them in light because you don't want them to sprout. You need to like put them under the eaves or in the garage, let all the soil and stuff dry off because if it's wet and you're storing them with other potatoes, they're gonna to start to rot each other. So let them dry off, clean off any muck and stuff if you can. Don't, don't water them, just let them dry. Um, and then you start layering them. So you'd layer them in, I don't know, crates or depending on your space, you can do it in boxes and then put either rows of newspaper, but what I find best is sacking. 
um, because sacking will take up a little bit of the moisture. The other thing to do is to check it every now and again, um, just to make sure there's no rotten ones, because if you do get one bad spud, then it will start turning the others around it bad as well. So if you want to be a potato storer to keep eating throughout the year, then you need to go for the later crops. Um, okay, so frequently asked questions that I get asked is, do you need to mount the soil? I think we've covered that pretty much already. Yes, you do, to stop those insects from attacking. Um, they will go for the new seed spud, and it's usually really tender and juicy and lovely looking, and the bugs will just try to burrow into it. So you should definitely mound, and when you stop mounding, they will stop growing. The foliage may still grow, but the potatoes underneath the soil will grow, but it won't send out new shoots to grow more potatoes. Um, what is the best potato to plant? <laughs> we ask this all the time, and it depends who you ask to what you're going to get an answer from. So we argue about it all the time. I was writing an article for a magazine last year, and I said, oh, what's your guys' favourite potato? And you should have heard the debates about it. So my recommendation is, it depends whether you like boilers, bakers, chippers. We've got a potato board up at the retails. Have a look and see what your favourite variety would be and what you want to use it for and then ask some of the staff. So for me personally, I love Lissetta potatoes. Um, it's nice and waxy, it's a really good baker, it's pretty good for boiling, although it's not fluffy for boiling, um, and it's a really good chipper. I also love Osprey, which is a really good variety, which is light and fluffy for boiling. Um, I always grow Agria and Juicy Bennies, which are old school traditional varieties, which are great. How about you, Jenna? Agria. Agria. <laughs> Julian? Agria is great for roasted Yeah. Yeah. And if you've tried, I don't know, you, once you try a home grown potato versus a supermarket potato, it leaves it for dead. The taste and the texture and everything about it is just sublime. And really, who doesn't love a good roasty or, or a good boiled spud? Um, so have a look at the potato board. We can help you. We'll come and wander around afterwards if you're, if you're wanting to get potatoes today um, and we can help guide you in the right direction to based on how you like it. Um, okay, so a late crop. We get this every year, especially in Christchurch. Like, it doesn't matter. We always get the late frost after Labor, you know, Labor Day show weekend. It's like, ugh. If you haven't covered your crop, it's a bit of an issue. Now, it's not... It's the sunlight when it hits the frost on the leaves that's going to burn it and cause the dieback within the plant. So if you can catch it before that stage, you, you're probably still going to lose some, but there is some chance to save it. So for me, if a frost catches my crop, I just go and lay some newspaper over the top of it, um, and then the sun not burning it uh, mitigates some of that damage. Unfortunately, it's not going to get rid of it all, but at least it might save some of it. Um, the other thing is just be prepared and have some frost cloth or something on handy that you can just go throw over top of your crop. Um, do you have any more tips for that, Jules? Oh, no, newspaper's really, really good. Yeah. Um, but generally what will happen is later on, when you get a frost, it won't kill the whole plant. Yeah. Yeah, so the problem is generally when the potatoes get frosted, it's when they've just started growing, because we've chitted them now for September, we've got them in the garden by October, and you know by October, November, you're starting to get some really nice growth on it. So even people even use sheets, I mean, just do whatever you can, just chuck over top. Um, but yeah, yeah, so full sun, six, six hours of sunlight a day, and that really needs to be some of that middle day sunlight as well. Um, People get holes in their spuds. So there's a thing called carrot worm, potato worm, whatever you want to call it. And what happens is this little worm that's in the ground burrows into your spuds and we get these spuds watered on the end of the season saying, what's wrong with my spuds? Now, this worm just goes through and just makes little holes and you've probably seen it if you grow carrots and stuff at home. Best way to stop it is crop rotation, really important. You should rotate your potato crop every year. Shouldn't be in the same spot year after year after year. You should look at your garden in a four section sort of module and we've got some brochures up at the counter about what those four modules are and what plants fit into each of those so the first best way to deter it from happening is to not plant it in the same spot year after year if you don't have that luxury what you can do is in the winter you can grow a crop called mustard so mustard is a green crop that you put into your garden and you don't let it flower 
don't ever let it flower because you're going to hate me afterwards if you do. But after about six weeks of it growing, we'll only be about so tall, you just dig it under and fold it into the soil. And that kills off those naughty bugs under the soil but leaves the good ones alone. So mustard is a really good crop if you're growing root crops, especially carrots and potatoes. Um, an easy way to do it. There are chemicals out there that you can use, but I, obviously I steer away from chemicals, so we can show you stuff like that. But also having that neem in the soil while they're growing will help as well in that season, even if they are in the soil. So neem's really important as well for getting those nasty insects under the soil. Sometimes people get a scab on the outside of their potato if you've grown potatoes before. It's from too much, not enough calcium in the soil. So calcium is in the form of lime. Um, so you can use dolomite lime, garden lime, but what you actually best use is a product called gypsum. Now gypsum is a neutral pH, so it's not going to affect the soil being lime or acidic, um, but it is going to add much needed calcium to the soil. Gypsum's actually also really good for breaking up clay in soils as well, so I recommend when you're planting just to chuck some of that along the bottom if you've had problems with the scab before. If you're rotating your crops, you generally won't have an issue. So the reason you rotate your crops as well is because each type, well, each of those four groups have specific nutrients that they're going to draw from the soil. So if they keep drawing and they haven't got enough calcium, by the time you move them, there'll be more calcium in that soil and it takes them four years to get around to the other part of the rotation. Um, okay, the other thing that potatoes often get is blight. Um, so blight is a fungus that comes. Um, some blights are from weather related. Planting the right certified seed potatoes will alleviate a lot of that issue. And if you are prone to getting blight in your areas, there are some varieties as well that say they're more blight resistant than others. So go for those. Um, don't plant supermarket just off the shelf. The other thing with supermarket ones is they've been treated not to sprout, not you know, by the growers before they get to the supermarket. So they've got chemicals and stuff on them, so you're going to have issues with them anyway. Um, so the other really common thing is, why do I get a lot of leaves on my potatoes, but not many potatoes? It's quite simple. It's about the fertiliser and the nutrients within the soil. Um, so in each, in each fertiliser, you've got NPK. So N is nitrogen, which puts on the top leafy growth of the plants. Your P is your phosphorus, which puts on your root growth. And your K is your potassium, which puts on your fruit and flowering. So for any root crops, we obviously want to go to go higher into the P because we want the roots to grow under the soil. So if, if you're too high in the N, which is the nitrogen for the top leafy growth, you're going to get all this beautiful lush green growth on the top and you're going to think, man, my potatoes are looking choice. You're not going to have many potatoes under the soil because you haven't taken care of the root part of the fertiliser equation. So we don't just sell different fertilisers because we're trying to sell you different fertilisers. This is actually specifically for root crops. Um, so not just potatoes, use it on carrots and bits and bobs as well. Okay, so however, if you've got fruiting crops, the, like your um, like citrus and stuff, the, the um, K part of the equation is really important for fruiting and, and having lots of juicy fruit as well. So change your fertilizer to what you're growing. Okay? Um, the other thing is um, a lot of people put a lot of blood and bone or sheep pellets on their potato crops. Really good because it's high in that organic matter, which potatoes and stuff are going to love, but they're also high in nitrogen, which is going to do the top leafy growth again. So make sure you're balancing out what you're putting out for the top growth with the bottom growth as well, because these guys, we want more bottom growth than we do top. Okay? Um, why are my potatoes so small? Give them a little bit longer. Give them a little bit longer before you harvest them, or if it's an early crop, they're always going to be smaller than a, than a bigger main crop potato. So smaller, the 60 to 70 days will always be around that sort of size. You know, your longer harvesting ones will be around about that size. Um, if you want to grow two crops, I chit now for the shorter one, and I plant them now for a Christmas harvest, and then the longer ones I usually harvest in about January. The other thing is in Christchurch, with the warmer weather, you're going to get more insects coming in around about January to February. So where you can harvest before those insects are out, it's a really good way of being a natural gardener without having to use spray, is to harvest your crops before they're going to come and get you. So if you plan on harvesting before Christmas and a crop around about mid-January, late January, then you're going to be pretty sweet for insects and stuff anyway, um, and funguses as well. Um, 
how long to I harvest? Again, we've talked about, doesn't matter whether it flowers, just pay attention to how many days the potatoes say they'll take to be ready and then have a little check to see if they are ready to harvest or not. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. Weed free soil is really important. Um, we've given you the potato growing guide on there as well and I'll be here and I'm gonna let you ask some questions in a second too. Um, just to explain about the tickets that you've all got. So the tickets, so $10 a ticket, you go into the Odorings Barrington store today and you get that full refund off, off any purchase. So you don't have to purchase spuds, you can get some veggies or some flowers or whatever, you get the $10 back. Um, you've also got a coupon on there. So the coupon is for the combo of the neem and the potato fertiliser, which is going to give you all you need for a successful crop, in my opinion. Um, so that, that little ticket on there is for those two together. The other thing is, if you need more soil to pile up, on top on the garden just use plain compost which we've talked about as well you don't need to go into potty mixes or whatever um, the other reason people have potatoes that are too small which i forgot to mention is because the soil is too light they don't like soil that is too light they like something that's a little bit heavy so if you are doing like a compost mix it's great mixing it in with the garden use what you've already got you don't have to purchase new soil all the time just use the right fertilizers and the right bases to give them all the growth and the and the feed that they're going to need do we have any questions? Yep. In the press a week ago, yep. there was the author of an article that suggested that the potatoes are best grown in rows running north to south. Okay. Have you ever heard that before? Any comment? No, I've never heard of that either. Maybe it's to do with the light levels and stuff, but for me, I don't know, we're, we're on a normal size section and although we do rotate crops, I'm on retaining walls because we're a little bit up on the hill. So for me, it just gets moved around and I have a good crop. So. It's probably more to do with where the light is during the day and how much sunlight that gives them. Have you got any experience with that, Julian? Yeah, well, generally, um, as your tomato, uh, as potatoes are growing, the sun rises in the east, so you get that early morning sun on yep. the way through on that arc to the west. Uh, that's the first piece of water. Okay. Yep. It, it's like a lot of those plant crops, you always plant them facing north. Yep. Um, so they, they get the max amount of sunlight. Like figs. Yep. Oh yeah, definitely, it's a good point. So what they brought out a couple of years ago is they brought out this product called Bugnet. Um, it's changed the name because there's a new product out now, I think we still call it Bugnet, but it's 99.9% effective against insects. Now they say 99.9% because .9 the 1% is for human error, or 0.001, because any issues they've had with bugs getting into the crop has been from human error not, not putting it down properly or protecting the crop properly. So the way that works is it still lets all the sunlight in. It actually works like a bit of a glass house as well with keeping the heat in. So you get these really big crops because it's nice and warm under there for potatoes. Um, but it stops those insects, even the tiny facilid, which is really small, which is a devastating insect, from getting in. So that, that crop cover is a really good product to have, especially if you're growing a lot of things that are susceptible to insects like the potato family, tomatoes, um, which are really quite sensitive to other things. So that's a good one to have. I don't think it's, it doesn't protect from frost though, the bug crop, does it? It just protects from... It does have a small amount. Okay. The other thing you can do for frost protection is there's a spray called Vapor Guard as well. Now it's not, um, what it does is it takes the plants down another three degrees. So if a plant could normally take a, a zero degree frost, this will take it down to a negative three degree frost. The only problem with Vapor Guard is, is when you get new growth, it doesn't protect new growth, it only protects the stuff that was already there. But it is, it is a good weed product as well. Where would you put the, the uh, niche on? Yeah. Oh, you wouldn't put it on until you got to that first sort of 15, 10, 15 centimetres because they're going to go for the foliage in the first instance um, because when they're under the soil, they're, they're not going to be able to get in there and that's not going to protect from those little worms that are already under the soil. It's only going to uh, uh, protect it from anything that's from the above. Only thing else to be careful of with things like your bug net is that you need to be watering at the right time of day um, because if you're watering late at night and you've got high day temperatures and the ground temperature, you know, you start getting this humidity level. It's the prime breeding for funguses and diseases and blights and all those sorts of things. So watering at the right time of day is essential. And I don't actually water at night, I only water in the morning. Um, and if it needs a top up, I'll do it at about three or four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, before it gets dark, to give those leaves a chance to let that water get off the leaves. You don't want water on the leaves, you're going to create fungus, you're going to create problems, and that's just not for potatoes, that's for all edible crops. Hi. Can I comment on that? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I'm from Rangiora. My wife and I have a quarter acre section out there, which we've been on for 42 years now. Yep. Um, and I'm a keen vegetable gardener. Um, initially, we had no problem at all with things like carrot fly or potatoes or anything else. But about five years ago, carrot fly seemed to move in. Yep. And a West Coaster talked to me about putting a microclimate plot over them. Yep. And I found it highly successful. Oh, good. We could leave that on um, and get carrots, well, the perfect carrots now are still three wonderful. Now, for the potato, still it. Yep. Um, again, the potatoes were good. In the 2016-17 season, we opened up our potatoes and here was this horrible brown yep. colour inside them and we learned about psyllid yep. fly. Um, and then I read the bit about it and one account said that if you put your early potatoes in and harvest them, say, December, January, no problem. Yep. And I confirmed that last year, they were good. Um, the later crop is when the psyllid fly comes in, possibly somewhere about the week before Christmas, yep. I suggest it. Okay. So if you're planting um, about that time, it's certainly a place to put something over them. Yep. So I found this cloth that you mentioned and made a sort of tent shaped thing um, and installed some drip uh, irrigation and stuff, stuff yep. underneath it, pulling yep. downward for watering, and it was highly successful. Oh, great. Um, the only thing I found, uh, probably because of the effect you mentioned of the um, improvement of heating underneath it with the cloth, yep. the tops were very, very strong. Okay. They had huge tops. Yeah. And I wonder if there's any variety that is less prone to top growth. I think I had red rascal in. Yep. And there were huge tops and they're quite a good crop. Yep. And there was no sign of any of these solid um, fungus winters in the Virus? Yeah, um, there's some new varieties out, so there's nothing really that is not going to get the facilit, Um but there's varieties like your Summer Delight, which is fairly new, and Summer, what was the other one, Summer Delight and Summer, ah, I can't remember, um, which are really heavy growers underneath, like I mean these are superstar big guys, and they put all their energy down low and they don't really care about what's up high, so you could try that Summer Delight. Yeah, um, just you were talking about neem, yeah, because it's something I hadn't tried, and that's quite okay. Just but at any stage of their growth, you think just put yep. it on yep. monthly or something. Or six weeks, weeks leave, six weekly. Okay. So for me, I do it when I plant, and then six weekly, and then by that time, I'm generally getting close to harvest anyway. So I don't usually need to do it a third time, but I will treat the soil generally anyway afterwards to stop all the insects underneath. So with the psyllid, I can I have a neighbour next door gets it, I don't. How and does it work physiologically? Well, I'm, I have no idea. It travels up through the plant. It's like a, you know, so there's roots will absorb it. So as you're watering and stuff, so it's like a, almost feels like a bark and it's like quite powdery as well. So the roots absorb it and it must translate up into the plant and then the bugs just leave it alone. Um, I don't know how it works. I just know that it does. <laughs>